Wyoming, August, 1835. As the heat of the day causes small rivulets of sweat to form on his brow, Kit Carson mounts his favorite horse, an unsettlingly coy smile stretching across his face. His pale blue eyes seem to boil with intensity, and his demeanor betrays a singularity of purpose that causes great concern to those close to him that know him all too well. Carson is angry, and there is going to be a fight. The sudden flurry of Carson's intense movements cause a stir about the previously placid camp full of mountain men, local natives, and fur traders. They have come here for the annual Rocky Mountain Rendezvous, the yearly gathering held just outside of what is today the census-designated area of Daniel, Wyoming, in the expansive Green River Valley. Stretched out along the banks of the Green River are an array of tents and teepees, representing a menagerie of cultures and goods for trade. Though there are several regional rendezvous, this gathering in the Green River Valley has become one of the largest. Though years before have been played with supply delays and fights with the local Blackfoot, this year's rendezvous is proving to be a roaring affair. In attendance are roughly 300 mountain men, roughly 2,000 Shoshone natives, several dozen members of the Nez Perce and Flathead tribes. Also present is a sizable contingent of company men from the monopolous Hudson's Bay Company. Many of these men are French-Canadian voyageurs, hardy fur-trading occupational cousins to the American mountain men. The rendezvous represents a unique opportunity amongst the tight-knit, multi-ethnic community to gather together in relative peace and safety in order to barter, trade, and simply enjoy the company of friends they had not seen since the rendezvous the year prior. The world of the frontier is indeed intoxicating in its freedom and autonomy, but it is also undeniably hazardous unforgiving, and often deadly. The opportunities for recreation and relaxation are often few and far between, and the occasions to socialize with friends and colleagues even rarer. Thus the prevailing mood at most rendezvous is one of communal excitement, camaraderie, and kinship. Though the mighty Blackfoot are an ever-present threat, disputes amongst participants in camp are generally kept to a minimum. Instead, the order of the day, in addition to the aforementioned festivities, is that of business. The trappers have worked long and hard for an entire year, often spending hours knee-deep in frigid streams, setting their traps and enduring all manner of hardships, from Blackfoot attacks, to maulings from grizzly bears, to simply disappearing into the vast expanse of the wilderness, as so many countless did. At the rendezvous, the trappers bring their year's bounty to have it appraised by the fur merchants who would then issue payment in the form of credit for goods. Once this order of business had been taken care of, the social underpinnings of the rendezvous would then take on a more and more prominent role as the days passed. The notion of the Rocky Mountain Rendezvous as a debauched free-for-all is a slightly misleading one, though not wholly without merit. While some mountain men are in fact well-mannered, well-kempt, and even well-read, some of them do indeed live up to the popular notion of themselves as hard-living, hard-drinking, self-aggrandizing, larger-than-life ne'er-do-wells who thrive in the wilderness but would struggle mightily to fit into civilized society. Among these is a boisterous, bellicose, and often belligerent Frenchman named Joseph Chenard. While regarded as experienced and competent in regards to his profession, one which involved traveling hundreds of miles via canoe and portage through some of Canada's most unforgiving wilderness, he is also resented amongst many as an incorrigible bully and insufferable drunkard. During the previous few days, all of which he has spent in a whiskey-induced haze, Chenard has managed to offend even the cast-iron sensibilities of the mountain men and natives gathered here in the warm, scenic valley. He has not only yelled at, cursed, or been generally impolite to a number of fellow mountain men and voyageurs, he has made the particularly ill-advised choice of making repeated advances on the young, beautiful Arapaho woman named Singing Grass. Singing Grass is an enchantingly beautiful daughter of a chief. In her early 20s, she draws the eye of most of the women-starved trappers at the rendezvous. Though, none of them dare to make any advances, as it is well known that Singing Grass is being courted by one Christopher Houston Carson. The two had met when Carson's contingent of trappers had traded and wintered with a small band of Arapaho. The Arapaho, whose homelands by the mid-19th century include large swaths of Colorado and Wyoming, are a formidable power on the northern plains. Along with their longtime allies, the Cheyenne, 
They have long held neighboring tribes as well as prospective settlers under a veil of fear lest they fall victim to one of the tribe's notorious raids. But, as is so often the case on the frontier, they are also known as hospitable businessmen to prospective traders. Many mountain men, Carson included, had cemented deep ties with the tribe over the years. He has made it his intention to solidify this relationship in the bond of marriage once he can procure enough funding from his season's hall to pay Singing Grass's father the necessary dowry. But Chenard, in his drunken frenzy, cares little for Singing Grass's honor, nor Carson's intentions. He repeatedly makes objectionable comments towards her until she is compelled to complain to Carson about his behavior. Kit Carson is known, for the most part, as a quiet, amicable man, notoriously laconic, yet undeniably commanding in his mannerisms an air of competence. Yet he is also known to possess a veritable hornet's nest of a temper, one that cannot be easily quelled in the event that it is agitated. Carson had been born on Christmas Eve of 1809 in Richmond, Kentucky. He had run away from an apprenticeship as a saddlemaker and signed on to tend livestock for a company of fur traders en route to Santa Fe. Carson quickly worked his way up through the ranks, covering thousands of miles of territory that was, for the most part, unknown to virtually all of his countrymen. He and his fellow mountain men spend their days setting and checking traps, plodding up and down river valleys and mountain streams and across vast stretches of empty prairie. It is a hard life, and certainly not for the faint of heart, but Carson has thus far excelled in this high-stakes world. He has time and again proven his mettle in shootouts with the Blackfoot and other native tribes, and by this time in 1835, there are few on the frontier who have at not least heard the name Kit Carson. Though he is not known to be one to initiate confrontation, in this case, with the drunken Chenard openly insulting the honor of singing grass, Carson sees no other option, and seeks no other option, than violent retribution. When news of Chenard's behavior had reached Carson just minutes earlier, his normally placid expression had morphed into an unseemly contortion of contempt and rage. Chenard had been busy all morning, not only making repeated unwanted advances upon singing grass, but repeatedly insulting the American trappers in attendance, calling them mewling schoolboys, and insisting that he would whip anyone who challenged him as though he were their schoolmaster. As his tirade had dragged on into the early afternoon, Carson, now having gotten wind of Chenard's insults, abruptly made his way across the camp. Carson was a man of imposing physical strength and commanding presence, but relatively diminutive size. As he had neared the mountainous Chenard, it seemed that the Frenchman's prediction of whipping the Americans like so many schoolboys might indeed come true. But Kit Carson was no schoolboy. He had marched up to Chenard and, through clenched teeth and with shockingly cold eyes, told the Frenchman that he would, quote, rip his guts out. The challenge to a duel was then issued, and both men retreated to their tents to retrieve their weapons and horses. The notion of a horseback duel is not at all common in the Old West, and almost immediately, seemingly the entire population present for the rendezvous have assembled in a crowd to watch the fight unfold. As Chenard rides towards the center of camp, now seemingly as animated as his adversary by malice and rage, Singing Grass and Carson's friends grow more and more concerned with the gravity of the situation. They beseech Carson to let discretion be the better part of valor and to let cooler heads prevail. But now, Carson will have none of it. Atop his large sorrel gelding named Apache, Carson, his distasteful smile now growing wider and wider, checks both his single-shot pistols, ensuring they are loaded. He tucks one into his belt and cocks the hammer on the other. He checks to ensure that his hunting knife and tomahawk are securely tucked into his belt and, without a word, wheels Apache toward the center of camp, riding off to meet Chenard. In a scene that begs comparison to a medieval jousting match, the two men face each other from several dozen yards away as onlookers goad them on. Suddenly, there is a collective pause as the gravity of what is at stake seems to sink in for everyone present except the two combatants. For a brief moment, the surreality of the event is so undeniable that it seems as though the fight will not happen at all. Then, in a near simultaneous explosion of movement, both men spur their mounts onward, pistols drawn, taking aim at their adversary as the ground between them rapidly diminishes. The mere seconds this takes seems like an eternity to all in the crowd, who have by now fallen silent in a fearful awe of what they are witnessing. It seems, 
for a fleeting few moments as though the only audible sound is that of the two horses' hoofbeats pounding into the dirt. Suddenly, two gunshots ring out in such quick succession that it sounds as if but one shot has been fired. The two horses and their riders pass through a small cloud of gun smoke, whizzing past each other in opposite directions. Carson, still atop his horse, wheels the animal around, unsure if he or the animal has been hit, only knowing that they are both still alive and must now turn to face their adversary for a second charge. However, when Carson turns, he is met with the sight of Chenard hunched over the horn of his saddle, pistol laid on the ground next to his horse's hooves. For a brief moment, Chenard too takes stock of his condition. He is alive, but his wrist has been shattered by the ball from Carson's pistol. The wound is both grisly and debilitating. Suddenly, the air is filled with the howls of the wounded Frenchman, whose inebriation seems to be doing little to dull his pain. Accounts vary as to what happens next. In Carson's own later account, he only mentions that Chenard did not trouble anyone at the rendezvous any further after that. Carson was certainly not above killing, as he had previously and would again kill men who presented less of a direct threat to his personal safety than had Chenard. No record exists as to Chenard's ultimate fate. However, the accounts of Carson that will follow from this moment on will see him grow from well-known tradesman to pop star folk hero in the span of the next half decade. In a world that is known to be mercilessly violent and universally hazardous, Carson has managed to cement his legacy as a legendary figure who can bear any hardship, solve any problem, and win any fight. While there is certainly a sizable gap between fact and fiction in the recountings of Carson's exploits, his status as a highly skilled, deeply experienced, highly impactful individual in the course of the history of the Old West is undeniable. However, for tonight, the many tales of Carson's other triumphs, tragedies, and controversies are other stories for other times. Thank you for joining us on this episode of History at the OK Corral. Be sure to click the like button, become a subscriber, and share this episode with a friend. Also, if you'd like to support our work and gain early access to episodes, as well as ad-free viewing, you can become a member of this channel by clicking the Join button or click the link in the description below to become a member on Patreon. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.